There is a great adage called Hanlaw's Razor, and it simply states, never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. And I have to tell you, the older I get, the more good old-fashioned stupidity I find. It's very easy to look at our current financial system and simply point at the ultra-wealthy and say their malicious, greedy behavior is why we are in the current mess that we're in. While that is a simple and straightforward conclusion to draw, maybe, just maybe, this comes back to stupidity and not malice. Specifically, our stupidity of abandoning gold and silver as money. We all know gold and silver have been money from almost the beginning of time. Yet along the way, we felt that it was easier and necessary to use these paper sheets of dollar instead. And if we're being honest, it seemed like it made sense at the time. Unfortunately, we couldn't see how it would ultimately lead to our demise. Instead of fixing our mistake, all we've done is continually tried to tweak and adapt this broken paper money system. As Winston Churchill said, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they tried everything else. What started me down this path was this chart from thevisualcapitalist.com. What they did was compare the performance of stocks, bonds, gold, 10-year treasuries, real estate, and cash between 1970 and 2023. The whole premise was to determine which major asset generated the strongest returns over the long run by calculating how much money you would make if you started with $100. Before we really take these numbers in, I need to point out that they calculated the returns by including dividends into the S&P 500 returns and cash was represented by the return on the three month US T bills. On the surface, the results would indicate that the $100 in the S&P 500 was the largest winner by far, growing to over $22,000, followed by corporate bonds at $7,775, then gold at $5,545. From there, the returns on that $100 looks a little paltry with a 10 year bond coming in at $2,200, $1,500 from real estate and $956 from cash. In the past, I've shown you similar charts like this one where we were able to see the returns as a percentage. But this chart from the visual capitalist really drives on the point that I've made before, which is in reality, the returns between stocks, be it the S&P 500 or the Dow, aren't really that different from gold in particular. In fact, since 2000, gold has been the best performing asset. The problem I've always had is that I felt like we were often comparing apples to walnuts. So I was really excited when I saw this chart and how they compared the $100 invested, but the numbers that came up simply didn't make sense to me. In fact, I was truly shocked by the differences in returns. And as I dug a little deeper, I realized that there were some significant and even fatal flaws to their approach. Let's walk through the three biggest errors they made and then determine the best asset. First, we need to address the elephant in the room, which is the erosion of the dollar and its purchasing power. At first look, your $100 growing into $22,000 is impressive until you pull up this handy dandy purchasing power calculator, which shows you how exactly inflation has eroded your purchasing power since 1970. As you can see, your $22,000 and $2,023 is really equivalent to $2,800 of real purchasing power. So while the nominal value of your $100 has exploded, what it can buy you isn't as much as it really appears. Now, let's compare that to $100 in gold, which in 1970 at $35 an ounce would have bought you 2.85 ounces of gold. Fast forward to December 29, 2023, with a gold price of $2,062, those 2.85 ounces would roughly be worth $5,850, $5,850. The key difference is that the $5,800 is of real purchasing power that doesn't need to be adjusted for inflation and devaluation. We all know the expression one ounce of gold back in 1924 would buy you a decent suit and a night out on the town. That same ounce of gold in 2024 at $2,062 per ounce would still get you a decent suit and a night out on the town. Unfortunately, because we lost our way monetarily, we stupidly, continually, and incorrectly measure assets in dollars. We all know that the dollar is not a constant. And Lee Boutigre says it best when he calls it the dollar gold exchange ratio, as gold is true money. This means the real question is, would you rather have your $100 in stocks from 1970 grow into $22,000 with a real purchasing power of $2,800? Or would you rather have the $100 in gold represented by 2.85 ounces of gold with a real purchasing power of $5,800? Now, without a doubt, someone is ready to scream, Dr. Stacker, you have to do the purchasing power adjustment for gold. I disagree, but let's explore that. If I put $5,800 into that calculator, as you can see here, it indicates that we would have $738 in purchasing power. Well, we all know that can't be true because we just had a discussion how a one ounce coin roughly gets to be the same thing in 1924, 1970, or 2024. 
The problem is this is a part of the dollar illusion and it's part of comparing apples to walnuts again. But let's take that issue and flip it around a little bit because what it really tells me is that gold would really need to increase to over $7,000 an ounce in order to keep up with the currency debasement we've experienced. We just happen to be in a place in the cycle where stocks are near all time highs while gold and silver are patiently waiting for their turn to take a run. It always takes time for gold and silver to respond to inflation and money printing, but they always respond. Next, let's talk about real estate and how the $100 pounded at 5.5% annually for a total of $1,542 in 2023. Unfortunately, this comparison is flawed as well. It's flawed because it doesn't account for how real estate is typically purchased, specifically your ability to leverage your money using OPM other people's money. Let's say in 1970, you used your $100 investment to obtain a 90-10 loan to buy a house priced at $1,000. This actually means you wouldn't have $100 compounding at 5.5% over 53 years for a total of $1,500. You would actually have the $1,000 home value compounding at 5.5% over 53 years. As you can see here, after 53 years, your original $100 would have grown to $17,000. Not only because of the $100 you invested, but because of the $900 you borrowed and that you were able to leverage. And so if we do the same purchasing power adjustment as we did for stocks, that would equate to just around $2,100 in real buying power. Now, I need to give you a couple caveats because someone will bring this up otherwise. One, yes, you would have a mortgage payment with that particular example I just gave you, but that's a payment you would be making anyway as someone who lived in a home or your renter would be making it if it was a rental property. So I don't see that as a big deal. And two, I didn't account for benefits like tax deductions. Well, I didn't do that because it just made things too messy for this video. As we start wrapping it up, I really want to thank and truly appreciate the folks over at Visual Capitalist because they gave us a simple way to compare $100 invested in various assets over the last 53 years. At the same time, in an attempt to simplify the study into a one chart and a few hundred words kind of document, they missed some very key distinctions that have two huge implications. First, assets priced in dollars have to be adjusted downward to account for the destruction of the dollars purchasing power over time. And second, the $100 invested in real estate has to be adjusted to account for the leverage of other people's money. So where does this really leave us? Well, based on my arguments and adjustments, I put together my own chart of returns based on $100 invested. Once I make those adjustments, gold and real estate are the clear winners in my mind because your wealth is measured in real and tangible assets that can't be inflated away. When we remove gold and silver from our money, we as a country and as a world lost our way. By relying on the dollar, we've dumbed down and over-financialized our economies. We've opted for a simpler explanation of money and definition of asset performance, one that is measured in nominal dollars that ignore what those dollars can actually buy you. This is why a million dollars today doesn't mean what it did in 1970. Just remember this, a million dollars today is equivalent to $121,000 in 1970, while that same $121,000 in 1970 would have bought you 3,457 ounces of gold at $35 an ounce. Those 3,457 ounces, which at today's prices, they would equal just over $8 million in real purchasing power. And it, just consider this as well. If you took a million dollars today and purchased gold instead with that, you would end up getting 429 ounces, which means somewhere along the way, you lost more than 3,000 ounces of gold. This new quantifiable information is a complete game changer for me. This tells me that I absolutely have to rethink what is the optimal allocation to gold and silver. This tells me that the research suggesting a 20% allocation to physical metals is actually fundamentally flawed. Wow, I can't believe I was so wrong. In the comments section, what is your biggest takeaway from what I shared? Did I miss something? Is there a fatal flaw in my argument? Or simply put an A plus in the comments so that everyone knows that you always stack smarter and never stop learning.